lightweight for high reps or heavyweight for low reps, which is actually best for growth. Some argue the first builds a leaner toned physique, while others swear you need the heavy stuff for any real size. So I decided to put it to the test. For the next 60 days, I'll be training half my body with light weights and the other half with heavy weights. I'll be taking daily photos and everyone is worried Whoa. about it look like this by the end of it. Hey guys, it's Dr. Yad. I'm a medical doctor, but I'm also a strength athlete for over 14 years. I've done calisthenics, where I've done crazy front levers, one arm front levers, crazy stuff. I've done weighted calisthenics, doing pull-ups, 80 kilo three reps, even though I'm 62 kilo myself. I've done powerlifting a little bit, I climbed, bouldering specifically. So I know a little bit about strength. I know a little bit about hypertrophy. And this video is going to be interesting because we're gonna look at a crazy study by Jeremy Athier. And this guy is going to finally settle the debate. Should you train with heavy weights? or with lightweights. But the crazy part is, we finally get to see what the results are in one person at the same time. He's doing one side heavy and another side light. Let's take a look. Today is day one. Ugh. To decide which side of my body I'll be training heavy and which I'll be training light, I'll be using the most scientific way possible. And it only costs a dollar. Heads is gonna be right side heavy, Tails is gonna be left side heavy. Let's see. He's actually not that wrong. The coin toss is an appropriate way to randomize. There are randomized control trials where they use this coin toss technique to randomize. I mean, these are a few of them. So yeah, so far pretty good. So here is my 60 day plan. Every major muscle will be trained unilaterally, meaning only one arm or leg at a time. Each side will receive the exact same number of total sets and every set will be taken as close to failure as possible. But the heavy side must reach failure within three to six reps, whereas the light side must reach failure within 15 to 30 reps. Plus, to make sure there's actual changes in muscle growth and strength, I'll also be eating in a small calorie surplus. So far, really impressed. I really like where this video is going. The studies that he mentioned, completely correct, okay? so. These studies have been done on high intensity and we have so far seen that it works pretty well for beginners. But the question is, will this also work for a trained athlete? My guess is 100% yes, it will work great. I see this in my own athletes, I see this in myself. Jeff Nippert recently made a video about this, you know, Jeff Nippert, big, big guy. And he also came to the same conclusion that it is actually the effort you put into these sets. And I like that he's going to failure. So the effort part is also taken care of and he's in a caloric surplus, which also could be an argument for why he might not be growing, but he is going to be growing because he's in a caloric surplus. Great stuff so far. But first we need a baseline. I got an hour long full body MRI scan that not only measures my muscle growth precisely, but also reveals individual muscles that ultrasounds Whoa. cannot distinguish. Studies hardly ever use MRI because it's expensive. Yes. But thanks to the coin flip, I do have some change to spare. Not to my surprise, as a right hand frequent user, my right side is slightly bigger. After 60 days, I'll come back for another scan to see how much each muscle grew and if there's a difference in either side. This so far is incredibly thorough. Wow, I am impressed. Also, very normal to have asymmetry between left and right. That's normal. Do not worry about it. Pretty much anyone has this. But man, DEXA, MRI, ultrasound. Woo! At the end of the 60 days, I'll be switching sides to see if they can keep up with each other. But I have several years of training experience, and I'm curious if a beginner's muscles would respond differently. Hey you! Yeah? Do you lift weights? This? So I found this dentist guy on the street, the perfect beginner guinea pig. So it's not NS1, it's NS2. Man, this video is getting better and better. Holy crap. The burn is crazy. It goes like gradually. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. They go like that. Now this burn sensation, it comes from metabolic stress during exercise. And it's common when you climb stairs quickly, bike uphill, or even carry heavy groceries from your car to your door. I feel the burn like around 16 to 18. Yeah. But before that, it was comfortable. That's the thing with the, the light side. Oh. At first it's like, oh, this is easy. And then it gets 
very hard. Whereas the heavy side is like, it's hard from the beginning, but you never really get the burn, you know what I mean? Yeah. The metabolic stress thing is a highly debated topic. A lot of people say that when you talk about muscle hypertrophy, the only factor that matters is mechanical tension. And there are some other people saying, well, yes, but also metabolic stress is important and sometimes even muscle damage. My personal opinion on this is slightly controversial. I think mechanical tension, 100% one of the most important things when it comes to muscle hypertrophy. But I also think that metabolic stress plays a little bit of a role. And I don't blame him. For people who work so hard to lose weight like he has, eating more calories can be intimidating. But deep down, I really wanna show Dennis how adding more muscle can also really improve his look. And for someone who doesn't have much fat on his body, current research suggests that even just a small calorie surplus can help promote more growth. Luckily, just two weeks in and it seems like the diet is already. There's even more recent studies done on this by Eric Helms, replicating the results, but also in trained lifters. And we see basically that if you eat between 10 to 15% surplus, that you're still going to gain muscle size without necessarily gaining fat. So that's awesome. His heavyweight side keeps progressing with the weight, while his weights on the light side have barely moved. I'm experiencing the same. My Bulgarian split squat has gone from 205 pounds to 215 pounds on the heavy side, whereas my light side is still at the same weight. So I was starting to wonder if this experiment was going to leave me with a giant strength gap by the end of it. To make matters worse, I'm assuming because I'm doing so many sets with light weights for high reps that the extra fatigue is really taking a toll on my recovery and mentally burning me out. So this is a very interesting point. Because he's doing this experiment at the same time in the same workout with the same person just left and right, there is such a thing as systemic fatigue. So just because he's doing it on one side, it doesn't mean that doesn't influence the other side. So this is a huge limiting factor of the study. The fatigue caused by one side could really impair the gains gained by the other side. And we'll never know which one is doing what. So this is a huge criticism to this entire study. And I think it's one of the biggest confounding factors. Ooh, it did not feel good. I don't know, I felt like a little bit of sharp pain. I heard right something the top of the knee. Heavy weights puts more stress on your joints, which isn't bad. It actually makes your tendons stronger and more resilient over time. But if you only ever use heavy weights, especially with exercises that may not be the best fit for it, it can quickly become too much for your joints to handle. So this is one of the biggest arguments that bodybuilders use when they talk about high intensity versus low intensity. They basically say, hey, we need a lot of volume. So if we do high intensity and high volume, there is a high likelihood that we're going to injure ourselves because it's just, like you said, a lot of load. And this is also why we have deloads more often in a high intensity type of program. So I have no idea, is he doing deloads? Is he, is he making sure that he's resting enough? And even if he does, doing that for one side versus the other side, it's, it's just a lot of things to think about, man. I'm panicking. Now what's happening here is called endurance adaptation. By consistently training with higher reps, your muscles not only adapt quickly by creating more mitochondria to reduce the burn buildup, but your brain also increases its tolerance to the pain. So it seems each side of my body is getting stronger in a different way. By the end- This raises one of the hardest questions out there, right? He's saying the left side is adapting to the burn better than the right side, and that one of the factors is that the brain can tolerate the burn better, right? There's endurance adaptation going on. But why would the brain only do that for one side? And I don't think the science has the answer to this question. It's the same reason why you're doing one leg stretches is sometimes way easier than when you do two leg stretches. It's too much for the brain to handle. But why, like, I don't, there's, my brain is exploding. I have so many questions. So many more studies need to be done. At the end of this experiment, we'll actually test both sides head to head. And the results were not what I was expecting. Cool, take it, take it, take it. So by week six, Dennis has become a monster. He's lifting heavier every week and his body weight has also been slowly increasing. Getting a lot of gains in that is a lot of neuroadaptation. So I'm not expecting that a lot of that is coming from muscle mass. It's just a lot of neuroadaptation, especially for the beginner. I expect bigger gains in strength because again, your body is just getting used to pushing heavier weights, especially as a beginner. So I'm expecting for Jeremy 
to have a lot less fast gains in strength, but nonetheless, a lot more than the other side. 15, okay. Dennis, not enough. This is oh, he's not going problem. to fill you. Your muscles are made up of a bunch of small muscle fibers, but also yep. bigger, more powerful ones. Type which two, are actually type one. Grow your muscles the most. But the thing is, these bigger fibers are only called into action yep. if they are needed. So with heavy weights, they're activated right from the very first rep. But with light weights, they sit on the sidelines until the smaller ones fatigue. Yeah. And the problem is, by the time you're 15 plus reps deep, most people can't push through the pain and just stop their sets, failing to ever recruit and grow their bigger muscle fibers. Yeah, because especially beginners, they don't really know how to go to failure. And as you get more trained, as you're more high level athlete, and it even depends on how well you feel on that day, you are more capable of going all the way to failure. So this is one of the arguments why going high intensity could be better, but it's also an argument for the other way around. There are some scientists making the argument that if you do a high rep range type of training, that you're more likely to eventually hit all muscle fibers if you truly go to failure versus when you do that versus a high intensity type of training because the high intensity is one more dangerous to go completely to failure and two we often don't completely go to full 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 failure so this could go both ways again so as much as i've been team heavy throughout this experiment i'm starting to notice its downsides if lightweights do actually provide similar or even more growth they can actually be a great option to work around pain and injury and I know for me, there's certain exercises like overhead extensions, where as soon as I go too heavy, it doesn't feel very good on my joints. Plus, in some situations, like when I'm traveling, all I have access to are lighter weights, which I used to view as a problem, but it might turn out they work just as well. The point he's making is great, right? Low intensity is often better for your joints, but it also even helps recovering and dealing with injuries. The only problem is, it's probably very good for hypertrophy and for dealing with injuries, but if you're a strength athlete, they won't make you much stronger. You're going to, at some point, have to go higher in weight. And this is where proper periodization comes in, right? We have periods where you train low weight and periods where you train high weight. And you make sure that you rest right on time. You have a deload right on time. Long as I continue pushing hard. But with 60 days officially over, it's time to test our strength. Whoa. Let's okay, see it's time. if the weak Dennis from day one is no more. All the way down. Ah, shit. Oh, he fail. What happened? And as I expected, his heavy side is a lot stronger, lifting all the way to 35. <gasps> Now, moving to the chest press machine, we see that Dennis was able to push 55 pounds on his left side, but couldn't push 50 on his right side. Makes no. sense. So that begs the question, what would happen if we took his day 60 weights from each side and switched them? Fuck, I need help up, up, up. Huh? I can't go up. I can't. There's no way. <laughs> Whoa. Good, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. I can't do what? that one. What the hell? Are you serious? Yeah, I'm not joking. That's that uh, good. This is all for show. <laughs> I know. This guy's the real MVP. Damn, what that's crazy. I so much wasn't weaker. That. Wow. Then, after doing 15 reps of 32.5 pounds on his light side, he went to test his heavy side with the same weight. <sighs> oh, I think it's gonna be <sighs> very close. Control. He's oh not gonna quite lower, hit 15, lower, lower. but it's gonna be close. Lower. lower. You're cheating. Lower, Dennis. Lower. What? That was half. That was half rep. Oh, I can't. Yeah, this is pretty good. I expected this. I have to this. apologize in advance. Why? Because I don't know how long it's going to take to correct this imbalance. Really? <laughs> oh my god. Despite the imbalances I created, Dennis was actually really excited about the gains he made. Enough to convince him to continue he looks very on symmetrical muscle, rather than just chasing at. But now, let's have a look at how I did. By the end of the 60 days, I managed to do 6 reps of 92.5 pounds with my heavy side and 65 pounds for 16 reps on my light side. But when I switched arms, my stronger side couldn't keep up. I failed about 3-4 to four reps earlier. Then, I tried to see how my light side would respond with a heavy weight. Right. Oh, was heavy. <laughs> Not bad. No. I could only do four reps. So, but this is way closer than the beginner. And I think one of the reasons is, and I'm pretty sure I know, is 
he has done heavy type of training on both sides. His body knows how to go all out. So the beginner, he never did that on both sides and he learned to do it on one side and that's why you saw a lot of neuroadaptation gains, a lot of strength gains in the first six weeks. He has already had exposure to this and this is why it's so nice to have exposure to different types of training. Instead of the six I got on my heavy side. The same imbalance also happened on my preacher curls. But thankfully my muscles did. Overall, I gained about two pounds. A bit of that was fat, some was water, but just over half a pound of it was actual muscle. That's gonna be but hard to measure. here's the real question. Did one side grow more than the other? Now this might be because I've just never trained my chest with such high reps before, but honestly, the absolute difference for every muscle was tiny. Sometimes as little as 15 grams. That's nowhere near statistically significant, and honestly, you wouldn't even notice that difference if you train this way for a full year. Both the ultrasound and circumference measurements told the same story, and ended up tweaking the right side of my back for the first time in my life. I may have to spend some time correcting these imbalances, yeah. but now let's see how Dennis's results compare. Do you think you built muscle? I definitely feel I built muscle. For so it seems that for the experienced athlete, volume seems to be more important. Not necessarily intensity, if you're giving full effort for both intensity and the volume group, volume is ultimately going to lead to more hypertrophy, but less strength gains. Well, you gained three pounds. Of that three pounds, pretty much all of it was muscle. No way! <laughs> Shut up! Awesome. Your fat, if anything, it dropped That's a little bit. Because six of times that, more. Your day one body fat was 18.4% and now it's 17.8%. So this is something we see in beginners and it's super exciting. It's true recomposition, right? True recomposition, meaning you lose fat, but you gain muscle, right? This is like a dream. This man must be super happy. Because you added more muscle, now your body fat actually no dropped. No way. Which is really good. That's it. sick, dude. I That's can't sick. believe it. So my body fat dropped without doing cardio. Yeah, and you ate like shit. Training was, I did not miss one day. No, training, you were good. Diet, probably. But now the question is, of those three pounds, where are they going? Okay, so me. your arm circumference measurements, your left arm, it grew by 0 0.8 centimeters, which is really good. And your right arm grew by... One point something? 0 0.9 centimeters. Kind of no difference. Left leg, grew by 0 0.3 centimeters, and your right leg grew by 0 0.4 centimeters. Now every muscle in Dennis trended toward the lighter side growing just slightly more. And I think honestly, if you would push more to failure, we would see even a bigger difference. But because he doesn't know how to go to full failure, because he's a beginner, it's something you'd learn over years, we see these results. The range right in between what we tested, so six to 15 reps with a moderate weight, that is what I believe is a sweet spot. It's light enough that Me your too. joints don't get beat up, but heavy enough that every set doesn't feel like a mental battle. Yeah. That's a rep range I'm gonna use for most of my training, but I'll still sprinkle in a few really heavy sets and a few really light sets for higher reps since this variation may provide an added benefit. But the big lesson from this whole experiment is simple. How much weight you use, it matters far less than how much effort you put in and the form that you're using. That's exactly what I said. It's effort that matters most. How close to failure can you get, right? How far can you push yourself? If you're dealing with an injury or you only care about muscle hypertrophy, just go for a lower intensity type of training. If you care about strength gains, then do a more high intensity type of training. And every now and then, do a low intensity type of training also because it is good to sometimes take a break, give your joints a little bit of rest, and it's eventually also gonna to lead to more exposure to different types of training. Periodization is the key. So this is an awesome video by Jeremy. It basically already confirmed everything I thought about high intensity versus low intensity. It's not that black and white. It's not that low intensity is better than high intensity and the other way around. Both have their places, both can be used in different situations, and both are great ways of training. So, Jeremy, thank you for making this video. If you guys don't follow him, subscribe to him. And if you guys don't follow me, remember to subscribe also to me. If you guys want me to react to a different video, send that to me. And thank you for watching. This is Dr. Yan, and I am out.